Who can tell me what did we learn last time we had a message from 1 John? Because last week we didn't have a message for you two because I was going on. Nobody remembers anything? It was only two weeks ago? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Melissa's thinking. Okay. Well, yes, Cameron. I remember the video clip. Okay. What was the video clip? Yeah. I didn't know where we were going. We think we're right, but we're not. <laughs> well, actually, the point of that clip was that John knew what he was talking about. That's the that point was, I was going to say. Yeah, that was what Melissa was going to say. So, John was saying in the beginning of this book, hey, I was there, I heard it, I saw it, and I touched it with my own hands. He's talking about Jesus Christ and the salvation he has to offer. And so John is like, hey, I am a valid, I am a, a, a worthy witness, I'm a trustworthy witness, is what I'm trying to say, of what Jesus taught, and what he had to say. So listen to what I'm saying, because this isn't secondhand, this isn't gossip or hearsay. This is a firsthand eyewitness account. So that's what that's how John, John introduces the book of 1 John. And it was kind of like the people in the other car, planes, trains, and automobiles yelling, you're going the wrong way. Yeah, well, in this case, John is saying, if you're living in sin, you're going the wrong way. Because that was the next point of the night. If you and I continue living in sin, there's a problem. And tonight, just like a good Hebrew author, he's going to kind of go back over a little bit of that again. Kind of the same topic from a slightly different angle, because that's how their culture works. Now, in our culture, we're like, oh, yeah, I already learned that. But you know what? You and I will spend the rest of our life learning this whole thing about getting sin out of our life, and we'll never get there. So if John repeats it a little bit, it's okay. It's not a bad thing, because it's getting too cold in here. Uh, but um, because you and I need this reminder. So we'll, we'll pick up the study here. He says, my little children, I'm writing you these things so that you may not sin. That last song we sang, be near, O God, to us. Our sin is what puts a wall between us and God. Sin divides us from sensing God's presence, from hearing His voice. When we're living in sin, we can even read the Bible and it just kind of goes right over our head. We don't, nothing sticks out to us. John says, I'm writing you these things. He told us in the first chapter, listen to what I have to say. Avoid sin. If you say you have no sin, there's a problem. Confess your sin. And now, writing these things so that you won't sin. Again, this is a reminder, a challenge for us to get the sin out of our lives. The rebellion against godly authority. The anger, the hatred, the malice. The lust, the lying, the stealing. You can go on and on and on. And he says, number one, get the sin out. Number two, and if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father. Advocate. What's an advocate? What's that mean? Anybody know? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Lisa, what's an advocate? You were stabbing at it, so. You, you weren't. Well, you were like, stab. Stab. So what's an advocate? I don't know. Oh, okay. No, it's not. No, no, it has nothing to do with stabbing. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Who knows? What's an advocate? Like an um, intercessor. An intercessor, yeah. Um, a picture from today in our culture, an advocate, if you or I get sued, what sort of an advocate would we do, get? A lawyer. a lawyer, an attorney. Someone who can make an argument on our behalf. <laughs> Unfortunately, using lawyers as a picture of Jesus Christ is probably not the right <laughs> picture we want to paint. Not to be too mean, one of my best friends is a lawyer. One of a few good lawyers out there. 
But the point is that you and I, if we do sin, Jesus Christ basically stands before God and says, that one is, is mine. And I paid for that sin already. Remember how we talked about how our position, because of salvation, it's kind of like this ring, not that the ring itself has any resemblance to it, but it is you and I as sinners. You can see me now, but hidden in the blood of Jesus Christ, God the Father sees the holiness of Jesus Christ, not the sinfulness of you and me. And that's what this is a picture of here. Jesus says, that one is completely covered by my blood. I have taken care of that one. You see, the Bible says that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. That somehow, and like this really bends my mind to picture how this all plays out, but at present, According to the Bible, Satan is still able to go to heaven and stand before God and say, look at that loser. Look at that one. That's a, that one says he's your child. Did you see what he just did? Did you see the gossip that just came out of her mouth? Did you see that backstabbing, that bitterness, that rage? Satan is the accuser of the brother. Jesus is our advocate. Now, the Greek word is actually paraclete, which means one who comes alongside. And they translate it to advocate because it's the closest thing they can come up with in English. But it's also the same word that is used for the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit came and comes alongside of us to help us live a godly life. So it's like the Holy Spirit is our helper, our advocate here to move us in the right direction, to motivate us to live for God. Jesus Christ is standing before the Father as our advocate before God. To say, this one's, this one's mine. And I've taken care of the sin problem. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, the interesting thing is, the only reason that Jesus can be our advocate and stand before God is because that He can be effective in doing that job is because He is righteous, because He's perfect and sinless. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for our sins also, but for, the whole, for those of the whole world. He's saying everybody who's put their faith in Jesus Christ is covered under His blood. He's made given right standing before God because of Jesus Christ. And he goes on on the next slide here and says, by this we know that we have come to know Him. How do you prove that you know God, that I know God? If we keep His commandments. You and I, we can say all we want that I'm a Christian. But it shows we really don't know God if we're not obeying Him. And, and in the Greek, to keep there is the Greek word toreo, which means to guard or to watch over. And, and the picture in, in the original language is actually of a palace guard. Who stands there, and yes, you know, in the British, the royal wedding, and they have the goofy little beef eater hats that stick up like a buffalo head on top of theirs, and they walk around with their guns and their goofy outfits. Yeah. Well, that's the picture here. And the idea is that you and I are supposed to be that vigilant of God's commandments in our life. That those palace guards over in England are supposed to be always, always on the watch. Because there are people in the world who would try and take a shot at the Queen. Try and blow up Buckingham Palace over in England. And he says, that's how focused you and I are supposed to be at obeying God. And keeping His commandments. The one who says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. You know, 
comes, uh, I come, oh, go back, keep it back here. Um, come to know uh, is in the Greek language is Noka, which is a personal knowledge of. Now the the root of this word is the same word in Luke that Mary used to say, how can this be that I'll be pregnant because I have never come to know a man? He's saying if you can... Uh, go back again. Um, he's saying if you and I could really come to know God personally in a deep way, really understand who God is, we don't. If we say that. We don't keep his commandments. We're lying. And the point of Christianity is not just the commandments, but the point is to know God. Because, like, a lot of people are saying, "Oh, Christianity is just all a bunch of do's and don'ts. It's so boring. Can't do this. Can't do that." No, the the point of Christianity is. Know and love God. But part of that is keeping His commandments. Part of that is doing what He says to do and not doing what He says not to do. And so, you and I, if we say we're a Christian and we just go around living however we want, there's a problem with our faith, there's a problem with our practice. According to John, if we say that, we're comfortable living in sin. We're a liar. The truth isn't in us. That's kind of scary. Because there's a lot of people in this world that claim to be Christians, and yet don't live anything like Jesus wants us to. And yet are comfortable living in sin. It says, yeah, they, they don't know me. The scary thing is with this, the point is we've got to get to know us in a relational way through Jesus Christ for us to get to know God. In Matthew chapter 25, at the end of judging a group of people, those who know him and those who didn't, Jesus said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, never and so to anybody who ever says that Christianity is about anything other than getting to know God they're wrong that's the basis of it all the other stuff flows out from that obeying his commandments sin puts a wall between you and God you want to get to know God you've got to get the sin out of your life you want to have a relationship with God you got to work on that attitude those actions, those thoughts. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him, in other words, the one who says, yeah, I'm a Christian, ought himself to walk in the same manner as he or Jesus walked. In other words, his life ought to mimic Jesus Christ's life on earth. And the word for walk there in the Greek is parapeteo, and that word means a para, it's a compound word, para is comprehensively, completely all the way around, and pateo is walk. That you and I, our lives should be completely all the way around walked like Jesus walked when he was here pretty high standard. Almost a little scary because I know I'm not there yet. I know none of you are yet either. Lord willing that as we continue to live our life and the Holy Spirit continues to prod our conscience and say, what are you doing? That's wrong. We can become more and more like Jesus Christ. But that is the aim. To get to know God and to live a life like He did when He was here. Anybody else?
anybody who tells you anything else is misunderstanding you. Is lying to you about what it means to be a Christian. Because that's the core of it. That's the foundation of it. And without a foundation under us, this building would crumble on top of us. Sink into the mud. It would destroy itself. And if you and I don't understand the foundation of what on which our faith rests, we will waste our life and not live the way God wants us to live. And, and guys, John wrote this book at, at the end of it. And we're getting there. And that's why the reason is called That You May Know. John says at the end of this book, I've written all these things to you that you know, that you may know have salvation. That you and I are truly Christians. Because again, that section in Matthew, those were people that thought they were Christians that weren't. And that scares me to death. Because I think how many people are in churches throughout this world that think they're Christians? According to Jesus' standard, they're not. It's a frightening thought. But John wrote this book to us so that we could know that we're saved. That we could understand and be at peace. Knowing that we're saved. That the goal is perfection. The reality of our life is we're going to sin. This is all from last week. Goal, perfection, we're going to sin. When we do sin, we have an advocate. When we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But sin is a huge issue. And you and I do ourselves, our lost friends, our God a great disservice when we don't realize that. When we don't take that to heart. When that doesn't change how we live our life. How we live our life. And to those of us who've grown up in the church and who think we've, we're doing pretty good, when you and I understand really truly how deeply flawed we are, None of us has any reason for pride. None of us has it all together. I don't care who the best person in this room still falls woefully short on their own. That's part of why, why Jesus said that to the accusers, the woman caught in adultery, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. That's not to say that Jesus is just okay with it, live however he wants, but just that you and I have to face the fact. As John said, anybody who says he is without sin is a liar and the truth is in him. That you and I have to face the fact that we are sinners. And we fall short of God's perfect standard on a daily basis. That means that we need each other, we need to encourage each other Keep trying and working towards obeying God as, as walking comprehensively as Jesus did in all areas of our life. In avoiding the bad and doing the good. Jesus spent his whole life doing good, serving God. And that's a standard for us to walk comprehensively by, completely by. There was one time when Jesus had been serving for a long time. I was just thinking about this today. And his disciples said, Jesus, come. No, it was actually his family said, come. And I believe it was. He said, you're tired. Come away. Eat something. You need a break. Jesus said, yeah, and they said, you need some food. Jesus said, I have food. 
from my Father which you know nothing about. And Jesus was saying that to say to that his family, I am so deeply motivated by serving God and loving other people that I'll be fine, that I'll be carried through this hunger, this tiredness, by that overwhelming motivation to serve God and love others. And so until you and I have that, we still fall short of Jesus' perfect example. Until we're that motivated that we spend every waking hour either talking to God or talking to somebody who needs God, we still fall short. The great thing is that leaves no room for pride in any of us. in need of grace and in need walking the same way Jesus walked. That you and I need to walk around every area of our life comprehensively possible. In this life, we'll never be perfect. But that, again, is that goal of perfection that God has set for us. Don't give up. Just because you, you won't get there in this life, you can make great progress toward obeying and honoring God. So I don't want you to go home and, oh, well, I'll never make it, so I just give up. That would be the wrong reaction. Keep fighting. Keep working getting rid of the sin in your heart. Forgive. Let go. Love. Care about. Sacrifice yourself for the other person. For their best. And ultimately, because it honors Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and close this time in prayer here. Father, I thank you for tonight. Thank you for this time together and for your word. It makes it clear what your standard is and that there's help for us fallen sinners when we don't meet your standard. Help us, Lord, not to give up. Motivate us, Lord, to keep moving on to love you and to serve other people. Spend our whole lives dedicated to you and what you've called us to do and to me. We thank you for this, Lord, and we just love you, praise you for who you are. We pray all these things in Jesus' name.